question is whether these companies are publishers, media companies, or are they tech companies? They always say they're tech companies, but in essence, they are publishers. And a lot of people believe, for those clients that you refer to in relation to the boycott, that they should be responsible for their content, which is something you know, that I've been of a view for many, many years. I'm not saying I told you so. It's just my view is they are publishers. Now, to be fair to Facebook, which I think you know, people are being unfair to them. Actually, I know that's a controversial thing to say, but they are being unfair because they have made strenuous efforts. Welcome back to another episode of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Farko Bekali, your host. Well, for today, I thought, why not look at the power of social media platforms? Why? Well, I'm quite sure you've been following what's happening for Facebook at the moment. Quite a bit of a tragedy with over 600 companies, big corporations as well, pulling or pausing their advertising on that platform simply because they are not fast enough in order to get the hate speech of their platforms. So this is an industry, you know, social media accounting for about 100 billion US dollars globally this year alone. So it's substantial. And Facebook being powerful as well, reaching about 3 billion people on the globe. You wonder about the power of social media. You wonder whether it is a media company or is it still a tech company? And you wonder whether it is really a friend or a foe to social cohesion and peace. And in order to discuss all of this and much more, hopefully, I'm joined today by Sir Martin Sorrell. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for your generosity. Del delighted to be with you, Patricia. I hope you're <laughs> safe, and, safe and well in Zurich. Yes, we are. Actually, we are. I mean, our lockdown is in a very beautiful part of uh, what is enclosed by Europe. Let me tell you, let me ask, uh, no, let me first of all, uh, introduce a little bit more to our mentory TV community, Martin, because you are okay. really the icon when it comes to media and marketing. You've built WPP. May, 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 maybe in my own mind, but hopefully, hopefully in other people's minds. Oh, <laughs> you are, you are. I mean, how can you not be, you know? You, you, you oh, buy yeah, yeah. your company. Um, you should be. You should be in advertising. You should be advertising. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I might be knocking at your door at some point. Well, anyway, all I want to say is you've done so many fantastic things in this industry. You know it inside out. You built WPP. When you left, it was a company uh, with a market cap of over 16 billion. You left it only two years ago to do the same yeah. as the Germans say in green and digital with S4. So you are now. A right. digital um, social media market digital only company. right amazing now this is why i have you on the show because yeah. i would like to know what is your first take how powerful is social media these days uh, considering its velocity and reach globally so the answer is very i mean very uh, if not supreme uh, close to being supreme, and that's part of the problem. I mean, you touched on it in your introduction. I think the central issue here, it, it's nothing new, actually. The boycott is about nothing new. It's really at its heart about whether these platforms, and let's call them, there are six big ones, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, and TikTok, which is a subsidiary of ByteDance. Kevin Mayer, the, the number two or the ex number two at Disney, where it has now gone to, TikTok and COO of ByteDance, its parent company. But those six platforms dominate. They, they account for, well, the vast proportion, maybe about 85, 90% of digital advertising. It's about 250 billion last year. And it'll be the same this year, although traditional media will fall this year by about 10 to 15%. The current estimates are as a result of COVID. Uh, digital remain the same, and digital will be more than half of the market. So the market's about 500 billion and digital will be 250. And just to put it in perspective, Google's about 165 billion of that, Facebook about 65 billion, Amazon, depending on which numbers you take, 15 to 20 billion, and TikTok, the only real major entrance is about seven. Twitter, Pinterest, around one and a half is, is, is snap, snap last year, probably two this year, Pinterest and Twitter under, under a billion. So that's the sort of landscape. Now, the question is whether these companies are publishers, 
media companies or are they tech companies? They always say they're tech companies, but in essence, they are publishers. And a lot of people believe, for those clients that you refer to in relation to the boycott, that they should be responsible for their content, which is something you know, that I've been of a view for many, many years. I'm not saying I told you so. It's just my view is they are publishers. Now, to be fair to Facebook, which I think you know, people are being unfair to them. Actually, I know that's a controversial thing to say, but they are being unfair because they have made strenuous efforts. Some people don't think sufficient, but they've added 35,000 people to their headcount to monitor, ed, edit, monitor editorial content. They raised the bar on hate speech, quite rightly, uh, at political hate, racism uh, on their site. They raised the bar in terms of editorial content. And, and eliminating editorial content. And they also tightened up the algorithms. Now, Google, if you may remember, had a boycott uh, in relation to YouTube around 2016, 2017. Yes. Yes. Mm. And I think this is a si similar situation, although the Black Lives Matters movement, quite rightly, uh, is, is gaining traction and there is a significant change in public opinion. Not like, you're, you're too young to remember this, Patricia, but 19... 68, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. There were similar movements, but not with the velocity or force, uh, quite really. I mean, this, the, the senseless murder of George Floyd, the senseless murder in Atlanta, all these things yeah. uh, are, are really, really crystallized. The so that, that's the central issue. My own view uh, is that the, the boycott is, is not the way to do it. I think you should engage in a dialogue with Facebook uh, if you believe in this, many of our clients do. Um, we've we've not advised clients to nix Facebook, and the reason being, we think pressure should be applied if you believe that it should uh, in a constructive way. I I don't think, and there's some very controversial methods yep. that I think uh, the the boycott movement have used, which are, I think will come out in due course. Uh, and uh, I think some of the pressure put on clients. Uh, and uh, indeed, Facebook, uh, you know, may be, may be verging on, if I put it politely, the unfair. Having said that, you know, change is in the air, and this is real change. Um, and we are going to see. I mean, S4 is a highly diverse company. About 38% of our U.S. people. We have a total population in, in S4 of 2,600 people. About a half our business is in the US, about 38% of them are people of color. Now our black representation is not uh, as big as it should be, it's around three to 4%. Yeah. And we're making strenuous efforts now through hiring, uh, through changing our hiring patterns, our human algorithms, if you like, the way we go about methods and procedures, uh, it, trying to eliminate any bias uh, and racial hate and uh, educate people. We're putting in a fellowship program for black, uh, um, people who from high school, not just from university, because the black population in university is too low, so from high school, so skills-based uh, operations. So it's all part of that change. But the boycott, which is really around July, yeah, uh, which is really around the US, and yet the other thing I would just like to say is this, it, you, you have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, Google and Facebook and Amazon, uh, they have about, uh, Facebook has about 8 million advertisers, and the bulk of them, as with Google and Amazon, probably about 60% of their ad revenues come from SMBs, from small and medium-sized enterprises. That's Those the are the engines of job growth and employment. So in a COVID-19 environment or in a post-Brexit environment or in a global slowdown environment, uh, these, these companies provide jobs uh, and they provide sources of employment, not just for the individual, but for their families too. So I think we have to get it into perspective, uh, and I think it has to be done in a more constructive way. Yeah, and I think that what, what you're touching there on, Martin, is so important. You wonder dialogue, is that enough? Because what we're seeing right now is economic pressure being applied on by the corporations saying either you get, you know, your algorithms basically sorted out that, you know, it's sipping through a hate speech and really pulling it out, or we are out. So, so I wonder whether this dialogue really needs to be applied because it is censorship in a way and I wonder to what extent it's only on the companies 
putting putting pressure on the media uh, on the media on the on the uh, platforms themselves or whether it is also users themselves because the users have been using this most of the time to actually mm -hmm. put hate speech there in the first place and how can you how can you through dialogue having that real root cause being sorted out martin well you know these platforms are about connection and connectivity uh, as you pointed out they they reach in you know, Facebook's case, about two and a half billion, three billion people around the planet. You know, there's a fair number of people still to go, but they are uh, pervasive and they are going to grow in power. Uh, as uh, And with pa increased power, by the way, comes increased responsibility. So these processes are in a way almost a natural. I mean, uh, Amazon, Apple are one trillion dollar companies. They will be two trillion dollar companies. Uh, Saudi Aramco, I think, is still the most valuable company on the planet. But I, I think the first to two trillion will be either Amazon or Apple. Uh, and I think they will do it in fairly short order. So these companies are extremely powerful uh, and they will grow more powerful as a result of COVID-19. And there aren't, with the exception of TikTok, there, there isn't any other platform that has invaded the territory of those big five that I mentioned now, three Western and three, three Chinese, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and they are, they are dominant. Now, with that power, with that power comes responsibility. Uh, the regulators are after them. Uh, I think that will continue. And so, but you're right. Users uh, have spoken. Now, now, for example, Facebook have stopped these boogaloo groups, these groups uh, that uh, have been congregating on Facebook uh, and causing uh, a bit of extremist mayhem. And they are starting to exercise editorial. Um, correction uh, they are starting to, to to behave like media companies i mean it, it is you know it is unfair for media companies because a tv company a newspaper can be sued if they have uh, yeah. you know uh, libelous or slanderous um, uh, content and so i i, I think uh, the balance is starting to be restored by this pressure but it's the way that it's done and i think you can have conversations i think far more effective to have these conversations, not necessarily in the glare of publicity, because it gets very emotional. Uh, having said that, you know, we've got an election in the US in November, uh, and this is going to bubble on until then, because yeah. this yeah. is, you, you remember the YouTube thing happened in 2016. We had three issues. We had brand safety, we had privacy, uh, and we had con concern about in interference in elections. Those were the three issues that YouTube was, the YouTube boycott was surrounding. And the same things apply to Facebook. The Cambridge Analytica scandal, you know, where a company basically disappeared as a result uh, of their concerns about those three issues. Uh, it, it's, it's a similar situation to that, but because of Black Lives Matters, mm. because of the, the shift in public opinion as a result, because of COVID-19, this is even a more serious uh, and this is exactly where I want to want to um, interject uh, Martin because one thing is of course my question is it really presidential to use Twitter as a communication tool for what you're doing not doing in your opinions that is one question the other thing is you mentioned TikTok several times and it's been hugely growing and India just now actually banned 59 right. different apps from China because they actually think it's a threat, and that's a quote, a threat to sovereignty and integrity. We are at a different level now, Martin. I mean, we are starting to use or not use or ban social media platforms in order to protect the zeitgeist of our individual countries, yeah. uh, the, yeah, they, the movements themselves. Where is this going to play out? The Indian TikTok issue is a slightly different issue. This is about the tensions, I think, at the heart of it. At the border. Between at chi the border. China. Too. Well, India, well it's, it's deeper. It's deeper. It's about the border, obviously. It's about that. But it's also about global supply chain as well. You know, with COVID-19 challenging the, the intelligence of a global supply chain, India is an alternative uh, for a more fragmented supply chain or indeed the base of a global supply chain. So there is an economic rivalry as well as a sort of military issue, a ter territorial issue there. But there are a whole series of issues between China and India, so slightly different. On the question about whether it's presidential to tweet or not, well, you could argue that, you know, Roosevelt, Roosevelt's fireside chats you know, over the radio then 
or Kennedy's powerful TV presence or Reagan's powerful TV presence, which went over the heads of the Senate and the House direct to the people. This is the same thing, but in a different... No, so I, I, I think what Trump, at the heart of what President Trump does uh, is extremely intelligent. Now, there may be messages that he sends, for example, the, the looting and shooting co comment. Yeah. There may be, which has caused a lot of the... Retweet something he actually, actually didn't check out. There's a, so the source saying when it comes to white power, I don't know where to remember. Yes, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, there was, that, there was that, but then there was the looting and shooting. Uh, yep. you know, looting starts, the shooting mm -hmm. starts. And, and I think, you know, you, you, if you do do that, which I think my view is, from a political point of view, it is an intelligent thing to do, to appeal to your base, to your supporters directly. I mean, it's rather like communicating, if I make the analogy in this way, in a company. Uh, you should communicate. I mean, during COVID-19, I mean, the irony of all this uh, is, is that you, you, you know, over-communicating is apple pie and motherhood, but you, in COVID-19, for example, like every Sunday, I communicate with every one of our 2,600 people uh, on a one-to-one -one basis and encourage them to communicate. So it's the same thing in a way, but obviously on a much bigger scale. Yeah, but I was the about to say, but here... On the nature, the nature of the communication, that's if, it. It is if it's inflammatory, I mean, you, you have to be balanced in it. So I think you have to use it in an effective way. But the principle is, is um, this is an old principle. This, is, this goes back... Um, Many, many years. I'm sure the, the Romans did it as well. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. When they were sitting there in their Roman by, by, house talking by pigeon, to each other. By, by, by pigeon post. <laughs> by pigeon post as well. No, but I think you touched there on a very important issue, Martin, and that is really the scale. So I think here the numbers and the mass of whatever you communicate and the velocity is really the damaging part of whatever you say. Be it positive, uh, a bit negative. Yes, but the same, it's, a same, it's, a same, it's the same thing, Patricia, in, in, in corporate communications, whether that, you know, you can't, you can't segment anymore. What you send internally goes externally. You have to assume it's going to appear on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But when you, when you send a communication, no matter how authentic, which it should be, uh, or direct, which it should be, or truthful, which it should be, you have to, you know, you have to think about all the ramifications and the impacts and the implications of what you write. And, you know, you have to think about, you know, I said, we're a very diverse company. So we are dealing with many races, many ethnicities, many points of view, and everything we communicate has to be put through those filters, if you like. So it's quite difficult. Uh, and you have to be sensitive to it. And uh, you, you, know, you have to sometimes err on the side of, side, side of caution because yeah. some people have different views. Yeah, and, and I think self-responsibility also filters into that, Martin, because one thing is the sourcing is getting more and more difficult to source simply because of this huge plethora of um, information sources. But us users, we need to be a bit more critical maybe as well and kind of stop and think what it really means if I retweet something or I share something and where yeah, it but fall onto. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit... You know, to, to suggest, you know, when people say that, you know, social media is biased or these platforms are, are, are biased or they have biased content. I mean, when, to be blunt, um, when you look at CNN or when you look at CNBC or when you look at Fox uh, or when you look at any of these, these channels, they, they have some inbuilt political biases themselves. I mean, you know, some people will claim that the BBC has, you know, there's been a lot of controversy I mean, the, the conservative government. I mean, our prime minister, I think, has re refuses. I mean, it's interesting when the Times launched their radio network just, just recently, which I think is a very good move, who was their first guest? It was uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Uh, and and it he was on at exactly the same time as Radio 4, which is the BBC's lead uh, news program. Um, and you know, B Radio 4 actually had... Is Starmer, the head of the opposition, on, uh, in, and we're, we're asking him actually what many people regard as being some fairly woke questions, as they're known. 
um, you know, which sort of the, the right thing to 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 ask. And whereas Boris was um, sounding off about Roosevelt and his New Deal, uh, which isn't really a New Deal because it's not forty percent of GDP, which is what. Roosevelt's New Deal was his is only one percent. It's directionally the right way to go, his stimulus program, but it's not big enough. Um, but it's interesting. I, you know, I think traditional media have their biases too, uh, which I think the consumers. You know, David Ogilvy used to say it's not not the right thing to say anymore. The consumer is not a moron; it's your wife. So we would now say it's your partner, yeah. uh, which would be much more politically correct. But the point is well made, is that they're, they're, they're not morons. And people do understand, you know, when they read The Sun or The Mirror or The Times or The Telegraph in the UK or The Financial Times, mm -hmm. they know politically where these, I mean, the reason they read them often is because the political views that the editorials express are the views that the people want to hear and they like hearing and that's why they read them in the first place. So. You know this bias that is that is said to exist in some of these platforms in their algorithms or in the way they behave is a little bit unfair. Yeah. No, I think uh, in terms of you know I don't have you for very long, much longer, but yeah. the political issue um, is very important, and I think you are such an opinion leader. You have a lot of knowledge. You know many, many super hubs. So people in the know. What do you think? Can uh, what's happening with COVID nineteen really swing the elections in the U.S.? It is a is it a, a go or a stay for Trump? What do you foresee? You think? Well, every 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 poll that you see uh, says Biden ahead and, and Biden has a habit uh, which I can I be so of putting his foot in his mouth when when he opens it so I think he has been told by his advisors uh, and intelligently I think he's listened to them he is not saying anything he is leaving it up to the president having said that you know the the polls have been wrong on brexit the polls have been wrong uh, on the previous election and you mustn't underestimate Trump. He hasn't done nothing. And his popularity ratings have fallen over time, but they've never gone below that sort of 35, 40%, which you actually find in many countries. You found it in Brazil with Lula. You found it uh, in, in Argentina. Even populist leaders seem to sort of have a bedrock of support around the 35 to 40% level. And Trump has not lost that core support. So it would, in theory, be very much, very easy for him to be able to recapture, I think, support. And so I wouldn't bet against him. I, I think whatever the polls say, and it's a long way to go, the economy is improving. Uh, they, the, the incumbent has their hands on the economic levers so they can pull them, and they can pull them aggressively. Market, markets are strong. The markets are V-shaped stock markets they're looking through 2020 to 21 in our own you know the big industries that are, that are benefiting and we're, we're at an all, all close to an all-time high we're capped at only 1.7 billion dollars but from a zero start 20 months ago yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. so so uh, and us you know we, we reflect the the v-shape of tech healthcare is strong uh there's also a, a big v-shape around obviously in-home entertainment and gaming, and then uh, online shopping. I mean, one third of US, uh, the US population are trying shopping for essentials and groceries for the first time online. So consumers are, are, are engaging more and more with on, online and, and digital transformation. Media owners are moving from analog to digital far faster. You see it with streaming on television with Disney and Disney Plus and, and Netflix, you see it with newspapers falling and Rupert Murdoch closing 100 plus titles in Australia. And then finally, people running corporations, digital, digital uh, I mean, managers running corporations, it, where, where separation between ownership and control in particular, where they were sort of what frightened, worried about digital disruption and transformation. You know, they could grow their top line by two or three percent. They could pair costs, they could buy back stock, they grow their EPS by five to ten percent. Everything was hunky dory. That's now gone. Q2 is a disaster. We'll see the results coming out now in the next couple of weeks. It'll be a bloodbath. But the market's looking through that. But so in digital transformation, you're going to see companies embracing transformation far more rapidly than they ever did before. So 
So digital is on the up with consumers, with media, and with enterprises. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's uh, what you're saying is look at S4 because we are in a V shape. Our you know market cap is going up because we actually represent. And if you think about the advertising uh, industry itself, it's always the one really leading as a leading indicator where the spend is going, i.e., whether there's an expansion. So that's a really important point, Martin. Well, yes, why? except 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 we are now more compared. S4 is compared more to the tech companies. I mean, it's you know comparing a. A pimple with an elephant, but but um, we're compared more with an Accenture or a Google or a Facebook than we are with uh, the old ad holding companies. You know, in, in like WPP, in which I still am the largest personal shareholder. So I, I I think it's it's a very different world. And S4 is purely digital because that's where the growth is. We have this holy trinity model around data, around digital advertising content, and programmatic data and analytics. We're faster, better, cheaper. That's our tagline, our go to market. And we have a unitary structure. So, no fragmenting earnouts. It's all, everybody has a stake in the overall enterprise. And we, we, we live or die, we succeed or perish, depending on the success of the company as a whole, not, not one individual part of it. That's a really important point. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, those, that, those days have gone. Those yeah. days. So, integration and coordination are, the, are, are increasingly important. Yeah. And uh, Martin, you, back in 2000, you were knighted to Sir Martin and on your shield, yeah. distance and speed, that seemed to be your yes. model. If you had, you know, the chance now to look, well, you do have the chance to look back at your, at your life, <laughs> your professional life, what are the key things you would really pass on saying, you know, this is, uh, this makes life worth living? What would you say? Well, I think, you know, I think, advice i mean i this morning we got a couple of emails from people saying you know they're just graduating from university what should they do so you know i just given the same advice my dad gave me which was you know find an industry that you enjoy i think that's critically important find a company inside that company that industry that that you enjoy and you're fun to work at or you interesting to work at build a reputation in it i don't mean you know external reputation but internally with not just with the people inside the company, but all the clients, all the suppliers, but also investors and fund managers, etc. And then, you know, after a period of time, if, if you fancy it, have a go on your own. I mean, that's what he said to me. And that's basically what, what, what I thought. <laughs> yeah. And, no, you, you, may cho you may choose to stay. I mean, this is counter to a lot of the advice that people give. I mean, the other advice would be learn Chinese and code. I think that is two languages that everybody should have. And, I don't have either, but um, so I think that's that's really important. Still, even with the G two split, with deglobalization, you know, with the growing gulf uh, between the developed nations and the faster growing markets, all of which, you know, worry me. Um, I still think learning Chinese and code are the two, the the two the two key languages. In addition to to English, obviously, obviously, and maybe Spanish, maybe. Um, so I, I think, <laughs> no Hungarian I think, there. Uh, <laughs> I should, and maybe I should throw French in, but um, it and German. Um, but, but having having <laughs> having, 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 having just learn the languages, you can speak. You don't have anything to say, but hey, you can speak. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm just like the British generally. You know, we just speak English, and that's it. There's a, a little bit of Yiddish, but there's nothing more. Um, so, so I think that's the, that's the advice, but that runs counter to what everybody thinks is the right thing to do now, which is to flip from flower to flower, you know, to go from one co one company to another or one job to another. I still don't think that's the right thing to do. And, and then the other thing I think is invest in the company in which you're in, because that's the company you know best. I mean, if it's a if it's a bad investment, don't. But my dad used to say, you know, the company you know most about is the company you work in. So, and, and that's where you should invest. And I, I think one of the killers, and I put it as strong as it, is this separation between ownership and control. And I think fusing that to one. So, so to make sure that management has a very significant, not options. You know, Warren Buffett said many, many years ago, you wouldn't give an institution a call on your stock at zero cost for 10 years. So why would you do that for management? These options make no sense. But, you know, go out and borrow money. Go and mortgage the house and mortgage the kids and the, the family and the dog and uh, in, in, invest, it, invest it in the company.
unless they got to take a risk. No, I think that's a vote that's of confidence. Yeah, it's a vote of confidence. Yes. And you know, um, Martin, me investing also in in startup companies, scale up companies. I look at the team. You know, at the end of the day, I am investing in people. And if they yeah. show me that they are credible, that they're behind what they what they do, what they say, but not only with the words, but really put the money where their mouth is, that creates a lot of confidence, yes. And that's a huge, huge point. I mean, I look back at WPP and the board of WPP has no, no shares. I mean, what shares they have are probably restricted stock that they were given uh, or options. And they have no... There is no uh, financial commitment. And I think, you know, I remember Jorge Lehman at 3G saying, we're, we're having a, a conference on um, governance. And he, he, he sat there for an hour not saying anything. And I said at the end, well, you haven't said anything. And he said, well, I sort of don't believe in it. The corporate governance, are, or the corporate governance I believe in is where, you know, management has a stake in the enterprise. And I think that's critically important. It might make them too short term. That's a risk. So you have to make sure it's that they're sort of looking at the, the long term. But I think can these controlled companies in the game. get Chris, Chris, Yeah. But these controlled companies get, you know, we're back to Zuckerberg and Facebook. I, I think he makes decisions in the long term interests of the company or Tesla. I mean, Elon Musk comes on in for a lot of criticism on the compensation and he, he is as a result of his success now. As, as, a, as rich as Croesus, as one journal said this morning. But having said that, he, he is pulling off a miracle, not only on the ground, but in space too. Yeah. Um, so, so he's an extraordinary individual. And, you know, he, he has a better game. I mean, for him to be the largest company by market cap, he surpassed to, Toyota now. Uh, you know, and his figures, latest figures. And, and, and as they said on... CNBC this morning, they might make a profit in the second quarter. $230 billion of market cap and they might make a profit. Oh, I know. So much goodwill and hope and really investment into the future. Martin, yeah. thank you so much. You have to hop the Pleasure. next uh, three minutes. Thank you so much for joining me on Mentory TV, sharing your wisdom um, and your time. Generous as ever. Well, I hope there was some wisdom. Thanks for thanks for the opportunity, Patricia. And okay. love love to everybody. Love to everyone. <laughs> thank you. Ciao. And thank you, thank you. Dear Mentor TV community for joining me yet again for another edition. This time with Sir Martin Sorrell, the icon when it comes to media and marketing and well, now social digital marketing. See you soon. Bye. God bless. Bye bye. Stay safe and well. Thanks, Patricia. And you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye, Martin. Bye.